Well, if you were of a certain age growing up in America, and today we would identify that age as old, uh, you probably remember the wonderful world of Disney, which was brought to you in living color on NBC. And you had your chance of, come on, come on, Tomorrowland, come on, Tomorrowland, come on, Fantasyland. Oh, it's Frontierland. Anyway, uh, Disney did an awful lot to educate a lot of people on a lot of ways. And I never forgot something I saw in Disney. It was the demonstration of how fission works splitting of atoms. They took a giant room full of mousetraps. They put ping pong balls on every one of them, threw a ping pong ball into there. It hit a mousetrap that launched another ping pong ball that bounced into two other mousetraps. And all of a sudden, the room just explodes. This is called a chain reaction. And we nearly had one of those uh, just this week in space. It's not a nuclear chain reaction. It's something much worse than that. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. And this is your latest on the uh, catastrophe for human spaceflight, in fact, for human information technology that's right around the corner, if people keep doing the kind of things that they did just very recently. So, uh, guys, here's the basic setup. Uh, the Russians uh, performed what almost certainly was not a specific anti-satellite uh test. They sent up a vehicle to kill another satellite, and sure enough, it did. And as the satellite disintegrated, those particles began to spread, and they spread to the degree that they had to take the astronauts currently on board the International Space Station, put them into spacesuits, put them inside the Soyuz escape capsule, and hope that none of them were killed by little pieces of satellite coming at them at 16,000 miles an hour, or whatever the case may be. They had to move the space station. That's not the danger. Losing the astronauts in the space station is not the danger. The danger is the chain reaction that's got a name called the Kessler effect. And here's basically how it works. The Soviets launch, or anybody, the Chinese anybody, launches a, a specific satellite killing weapon. The debris from that satellite spreads out, then it hits something else. Now that debris suddenly shatters and spreads out, and that means the cloud is even wider, which means it hits even more. And in a very, very short period of time, there is no more space access for humanity because Earth has a ring of particles about that big, moving at 100, about 16, 20, 30,000 miles, well, I guess 27,000 miles per hour. Uh, so you simply can't get there anymore. All of the satellites in low Earth orbit are gone. The GPS satellites are further out, they're safe. Geostationary satellites for communication, they're safe. But when they die, you can't replace them because you cannot get through this belt of debris. Uh, Scott, uh, NASA uh, weighed in on this. The US government said that this was an irresponsible uh, thing to do. The Russians didn't deny it. They downplayed it, not, not a real big deal. Not many people are aware of the fact that we are one major accident from losing access to space for thousands and thousands of years. Just shut off, are they? No, I, I don't think it's widely understood. Um, I know that we have previously done an episode uh, about this uh, to raise the alarm, and it's good to revisit this, especially in light of the kind of s this the Russian uh, amateur game in space. Um, it just occurs to me that there should be like an amateur and pro league when it comes to space exploration. <laughs> like if if you're going to do stuff like this, they should say, well, you know, you can go up to maybe twenty thousand feet, but that's about it. We're going <laughs> to leave you there. <laughs> Until you show that you can responsibly use the tool, you do not yes. get unfettered. You don't get to sit at the adult table exactly. on Thanksgiving until you, until we yeah. know you're not going to throw the potatoes around. And frankly, as you were describing the Kessler effect and that chain reaction and the you know, ping pong balls on the mouse traps and all that kind of stuff, for some reason, I flashed on my uh, you know teen playing of the game Galaxians. I just figured like we we should have to develop some sort of Galaxian-like technology where we could fly something up into low Earth orbit and then just vaporize all of those little particles. Since we were able to identify them and where they are, we've somehow got to be able to clean them up. You know, we could have a giant net in space to scoop it all up, um, but you know, it's somehow we're going to have to deal with this. And you know, I'm only being slightly facetious here. Uh, it's it's a kind of rules of the road crisis that you're going to have to be able to handle. Um, when I was uh, driving in Philadelphia once, I was stuck on the uh, the uh, Schuylkill Expressway just sitting in traffic, and I thought, somebody's car broke down and nobody can move. And in my mind's eye, I saw a rescue service with a helicopter and a giant magnet that would just fly over, 
pick cars up out of traffic, set them down in a lot somewhere, you know, and you could go retrieve your car there or you could stay in it as they flew you right, over. Right, Regan did a, did a routine on that. Yeah, I mean, to me, they're, they're, you've got to deal with the reality that people are going to behave badly, that, that machines are going to malfunction, that stuff is going to go wrong. And then what? Now, I'm sure NASA and, and any number of private space initiatives are way ahead of me on thinking of this, but I, I, I don't think you can just go on in blissful ignorance and say, yeah, I'm going to, for example, buy an internet service that's reliant on um, a belt of satellites around the world as Elon Musk has developed in Starlink and uh, you know carry out my business on that. And then find out one day, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the Russians ran into one of those Starlink satellites and caused a chain reaction, that, and the internet is down indefinitely. Forever. Yeah. For, effectively forever. Um, Steve, there are potential disasters like the the Yellowstone supervolcano erupting yeah, that we have absolutely no control over none. But this is not one of those cases. This is one of those cases where we continually get burned, and it's the same problems we had with the Challenger and the Columbia and so on. And that and 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 it goes like this: didn't happen today, didn't happen the day before yesterday, very unlikely to happen tomorrow. So therefore, we're not going to worry about it. But the so the the actual occurrence rate is low, the risk is low, but the but the damage is enormous. It's immeasurable. It, it basically keeps us out of space. And for those people who say, well, why can't you just kind of go above it and around it? The reason that all of these spaceports are as close to the equator as possible is because they use the rotation of the Earth to give them a little, a significant push. Closer to the equator you are, the more of a push you get. And if you're going to do an inclined orbit, that requires not only a lot more energy, but you've got to get up there high enough and fast enough so that you get beyond the ring on the other side. It essentially takes us out of space for the foreseeable future. And once this happens, we're now talking about billions, conceivably trillions of particles that are this big. There's no way to go and hunt them all down. Once it happens, it's done. And uh, I don't think very many people are taking this quite as seriously as they should be, Steve. Yeah. Uh, what's funny is one of my favorite movies, uh, Pixar's Wally. -E. You see uh, Wally -E cleaning his little trash robot. You see him packing up all the garbage, trying to clean up the earth and stacking it up in nice little boxes. And there's a point in the movie, I think it's near the beginning, where the camera pulls back and you see the earth and then you see the earth's orbit. And there is a ring of trash in mm -hmm. orbit. And I thought, wow, somebody read their Kessler and included it in a kid's movie. Um, I was just, I was really, really taken aback by that. Um, here's what concerns me. Uh, not so much one of these, these rogue tests like, uh, like Russia did recently and China did before that. Um, I would like to at least think they are, uh, uh, planning ahead and hitting something that is in a place not at risk for starting off this chain reaction. Um, but uh, the First World War was a war of mass. You know, you had two million men practically shoulder to shoulder from the Swiss border to the Channel. And against them was a mass of machine guns. Uh, the Second World War was a war of mass production. Uh, the Cold War was a war of uh, economy versus economy. If there's another major power war, it's going to be a war of systems, electronic systems. And the temptation will be almost irresistible, probably irresistible, to start knocking out the other guy's satellites left and right to leave them blind so that their systems can no longer work. And that scares me a lot more than, say, uh, the communist Chinese taking over the free Chinese in Taiwan. That uh, that worries me a, a lot more than Russia taking eastern Ukraine or anything like that. These would be right. bad things, horrible things for the locals involved. But if the U.S. and Russia, the U.S. and China, or all three of us start knocking down satellites left and right with kinetic weapons, there's your doomsday That's scenario it. right there. Space flight's gone. It's gone yeah. for the rest of this, the, the duration of the species. Yeah. So... Sleep well, tight. as as I said, folks, you know we know that we have uh, all kinds of vulnerabilities with our current electrical grid. It's vulnerable to EMP attack. It's vulnerable to solar storms. We know the threats out there, but we didn't do anything about it. Just like we didn't do anything about the O rings on the 
boosters on Challenger. We didn't do anything about the foam coming off of the external tank on Columbia. We don't do anything until after the catastrophe happens and we try to close the door. Now, in those cases, you could actually make changes afterwards and solve the problem. But in this case, you can't. If this happens, it's done. Most people aren't aware of the fact that currently uh, U.S. Uh, strategic, well, it used to be Strategic Air Command, I guess Space Command has it now. We are currently tracking tens of thousands of objects in space, mo many of them as small as a single nut or bolt. We know where they are, and there are probably maybe as much as a million of them, but we can track them and we know where they are. And occasionally we have to move things out of the way if we see a potential conflict. If the Kessler effect happens and this cascade goes on, it's like a shotgun blast. There is simply nothing we can do about it. But there's something that we can do about it now. Most people don't realize that almost half of the stuff that's in orbit now are spent booster stages. You launch a, a rocket into orbit, your orbit will bring you right back down to the launch pad. That's the orbit. It'll take you all the way around the world and bring you right back down to the Kennedy Space Center crash. So that booster has to go up and on the far side of the, of the orbit, it has to fire again to circularize the orbit. So we've got hundreds of dead boosters that are up there. I don't know how many dead satellites there are up there, but there's an awful lot of those too. And those things we can catch. Those things are, are, are stuff that we can actually catch. We can catch them, we can decelerate them, we can slow them down, burn them up in the atmosphere. We better start taking this seriously because if it's up to us to stop trillions of particles in space, space flight is done for humanity, for the duration of humanity. But we can go into that room full of mouse traps and pull enough of the mouse traps out of there so that the chain reaction opportunity goes way, way down. We shouldn't be thinking about what we do to clean up after the, the, the cascade, because there is no cleaning up after the cascade. But we still have time to make a concerted effort to deorbit all of the junk so that there are not enough targets for this cascade chain reaction to form in the first place. And I have a very bad feeling that we're going to do what humans do, and that is nothing until after the catastrophe happens. But after this catastrophe happens, that's it. There is, there's no solution on the, on the horizon or beyond. So write your congressman and write your um, entrepreneurs, write Elon Musk and tell them to start getting busy, getting some of that stuff out of there or else nobody's going nowhere for a long, long time. That'll do it for this edition of Right Angle Made Possible by the members at BillWhittle.com. We'd love to have you join us over at BillWhittle.com. And even if you don't, we'll still see you next week right here on Right Angle.